Good morning. So the topic, uh, as um, you just heard, is two stories of the European debt crisis. Now, the plan of the lecture is like this. First, we are going to discuss what is a, a sovereign debt crisis. I will give you uh, some definitions. Then we'll move to um, two different stories, two different explanations of why the, the crisis happened. So the first one is what I call a neoclassical view, and the second one is the aggregate demand view, aggregate demand tradition. And um, since uh, we will learn why crisis happens in, in, both, in both two theories, then I will present what to do uh, in order to end the crisis, and I will, I will end with showing uh, some data and an econometric model. So, what is a sovereign debt crisis? Well, there are probably many different uh, definitions, but the one that I use is that a sovereign debt crisis is a situation in which uh, there is a failure of a government to meet a principle or interest on uh, a payment of, of uh, national debt. Now, this failure to pay, to pay a principal or interest might be manifested in two uh, different uh, ways. I mean, a government might decide that uh, it is going to repay the debt in a different currency that it uh, usually, uh, that it uh, borrowed money before. So, for example, in case of Greece, this will be a situation in which Greece decides that we are not going to... Um, to pay our debts in euro, but uh, instead we are going to deflate and um, we are going to uh, pay debts in drachma, or whatever the currency was called. Now, it is also a situation in which a government uh, repays its debt not in full or in a different period. This would also constitute a sovereign debt crisis. And this is a definition of two scholars, uh, two uh, Paul Krugman's favorite scholars, uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Rogoff, or I, I don't remember the names. <laughs> Kenneth, Kenneth, yes, yes, Kenneth Rogoff. And um, so if, if we think that this definition is correct, then surely Europe is in a, uh, in a state of a sovereign debt crisis. Do you, if you look at the situation in, in Portugal, in, in Ireland, in Greece, uh, and in other countries, there is certainly a problem with debt. And if you look at the uh, interest rates on, on debt in, in Eurozone and in Europe generally, you will also see that uh, they have increased. So there is something going on. So the question then is, uh, what causes that crisis? And there are many different theories, but the two major ones that I identify are um, first a neoclassical view and then an aggregate demand view. Now, sure, there might be another theories and a correct explanation maybe is somewhere between those two, but let me first present what I mean by them and then um, present some, some data that uh, I think support uh, one of these uh, theories more than the other. Now, what is a, a neoclassical view, neoclassical tradition? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure if uh, neoclassical is a best word to describe this tradition because uh, the theorists who think that this, this theory is correct, well, some of them would probably not call themselves uh, neoclassical or even classical economists. Um, and uh, some neoclassical economists would probably uh, not uh, subscribe to this theory. I'm not sure if the Austrian school uh, can be classified as neoclassical school, but as a, um, a um, offshoot of a classical school, uh, as its uh, natural evolution, let's say, it might be, well, it's, it surely is more in the neo, sorry, in this camp rather than the aggregate demand view. So what does the neoclassical uh, tradition, let's call it like this, say? By the way, other people call it uh, this, this view of, of a crisis, a German view or a Calvinist view. So you, you will know what I mean in a few minutes. So the main reason of sovereign debt crisis, uh, according to this theory, is, well, a, a too much government debt. 
Uh, this is as simple as it gets. And in some extent, it is always true, because if the government uh, were, uh, would be running a surplus or it would be uh, running a balanced budget, then we would not talk about any, any government sovereign, I mean, sovereign debt crisis. But the reality is different. The reality is that uh, governments uh, do hold debt. And, uh, well, sometimes it happens that one government who holds a lot of debt is in crisis, is unable to repay its debt, and the other government who also has debt, well, um, is, uh, is, able to, um, is able to repay it. So the one is in trouble and the other one is not. And the neoclassical theory is a theory that, uh, that says uh, why, why these governments, uh, some governments have problems with repaying their debts. Now, um, so how does the process of accumulating too much debt looks like? And by the way, when I say that uh, the neoclassical theory is based on a, on, on a concept of too much debt, there is no, uh, no numerical threshold at which you consider that too big. Um, so, so let me go back to, the, to this explanation. How does the, the neoclassical theory explain what happens and why, why that uh, gets too high? Well, it usually goes something like this. Politicians are rational and they want to be re-elected, so they usually tend to prefer a situation in which they increase spending, but they do not increase taxes. So this usually takes place in two different ways. A first way is, of course, to increase money by a central bank and simply give it to the people, give it to the voters, and by this buying votes. Or you can go into that. This second solution, well, um, it has some advantages over the first one because if people are buying debt, they will get interest. So, so, the, so the politicians uh, think. So they want to spend more money without taxing more, so they issue uh, too much debt. And again, too much is a rather vague concept. It's, well, uh, as we will see, defined rather subjectively. So um, when there is more debt than it was before, said there is paribus, the nominal spending would increase. This is, by the way, the, the thing that the uh, politicians want to do, that the nominal spending increases. People feel that they are more, wealth, uh, more wealthy than, than before. So, uh, in a sense, a false sense of prosperity emerges. People feel, feel more wealthy, everything is going uh, perfect, but uh, what goes up must go down, <laughs> and uh, soon um, rea reality kicks in, and uh, there is a problem. And this problem is manifested when people uh, understand that what really changed are only nominal variables, not real variables. It is not the real wealth that has increased only a uh, nominal values of these of these assets, and. Um, when investors who bought that realize that they've been cheated or that the, the assets that they hold are not as good as they thought they are, mainly because they feel that the government will be unable to repay its debt, well, then what they do, well, it's relatively simple. Uh, they, they, once they realize that the government will not be able to repay its debt, uh, they start to send uh, to, to sell bonds. So a demand for bonds falls dramatically and when demand for government bonds, bonds falls, the price of these bonds also fall and the interest rate increases. So this is the, the next step. And when an interest rate uh, increases, well, if the government is rolling his debt, that is, if he is just um, taking very short term debt and then rolling it over and over, in order to refinance it, it will find itself in a problem because a cost of, of issuing debt will be much higher. So spending on, on payments connected with, uh, with debt would also be higher as a portion of GDP. And this, this is not something that, uh, that is uh, increasing utility, so to say. 
And uh, this is what happened in the Eurozone crisis, as the theory goes. Uh, the, the theory says that, well, while the Germans, uh, let's say, and the core of the European, uh, of the Eurozone, was pursuing a prudent, good fiscal policy, uh, the rest of the Eurozone uh, was not doing it. So countries uh, such as uh, Portugal, Ireland, maybe Ireland is not a good idea, but, but uh, Italy, Greece, Spain and other Mediterranean countries, the theory says that, well, they pursued a rather reckless monetary policy, sorry, fiscal policy, they issued too much debt. Uh, there are many different explanations why this was the case. Uh, some mention a different mentality, some mention different institutions. Uh, some Austrians also look at the structure in which European Central Bank is constructed and they conclude that it is uh, because these countries uh, were um, pursuing this fiscal policy and that they had this unsustainable boom and then the crisis. So the big countries uh, were running reckless uh, monetary, uh, sorry, fiscal policy and uh, <coughs> as soon as investors realized that uh, well, the reality is not as good as they thought it was. They started selling the bonds, interest rate went up, and uh, the crisis started. And this was the um, neoclassical theory. Now let's go to the aggregate demand theory, aggregate demand view. Now, when I talk about an aggregate demand view, I mean, I, I'm talking mainly about two schools, two macroeconomic schools that use this concept. So the first one is, of course, Keynesians, and the second one is monetarists. But let me go, let me talk about it a little bit later. So, an aggregate demand view is based uh, on a, um, on a assumption, or maybe not an assumption, but an observation that when people look at the nominal value of debt, they usually don't just look at the nominal value of debt, but a, uh, a ratio of uh, debt to GDP. This ratio of debt to GDP can be, can be shown in two ways, nominal and real way. And of course, if we use the same price level to, uh, to uh, make those variables uh, real, it doesn't matter uh, if we use real or nominal variables. So let's just look at, the, at this ratio as nominal sovereign debt to nominal GDP. And um, so, if nominal GDP falls, then this ratio is uh, going up. And if a fall in nominal GDP is uh, very high, then it would seem that debt to GDP ratio is also increasing. And some investors or some people might interpret it as a situation when the government is, uh, well, pursuing a, a bad fiscal policy. While, in fact, what happened is that a nominal GDP, for whatever reason, fell. I'm not going to talk about this in, in much detail. So, a problem if with um, mm, uh, a debt crisis might also happen not only when nominal GDP falls in absolute terms, but also when it falls relative to the expectations of future, future, uh, future GDP. So, if people think that GDP will grow at a rather stable level and because of external reasons it falls at a, uh, it, it, it grows, but it grows at a slower uh, rate, well, the government will have to increase taxes more than it originally planned and this might be a problem and this is what might uh, cause uh, a, a problem with uh, nom nominal debt repayments. Now, uh, just as I've said, the ability to repay nominal debt is, of course, based on the level of income. This is for many reasons, but the, the main reason is that uh, government taxes depend on nominal income of, uh, of, of, of a government. <laughs> um, and this, in turn, depends on the nominal income of all uh, market participants. So if the if income in the economy decreases, taxes will decrease, and this would be a problem. So this is simply looking at the debt problem from another another perspective. So, and this is what caused the the uh, fiscal crisis in the eurozone. The theory says. So we have two basically opposing theories. The the neoclassical theory was stressing that well, 
uh, it is uh, because of too much debt and the aggregate demand view stresses that it is because of uh, well decreased nominal spending but why did it happen well there are basically two complementary explanations the first one is connected uh, with the optimum currency uh, area critique uh, that is that theorists can, uh, who represent this view say that uh, once a eurozone was formed there was uh, a um, decrease in the uh, in the risk in the whole eurozone because the the exchange rate risk disappeared and because of this capital uh, has moved from from where it was abandoned so germany and core of the eurozone and it flew to, to where it was scarce, so the peripheral, peripheral countries. If we look at the balance of payments, it is also evident that this actually happened. And so the, the proponents of the optimum currency uh, area theory, uh, well, they treat um, the crisis as a rather exogenous uh, phenomenon. So they say that when a, a global crisis, uh, financial crisis happened, a uh, overall risk aversion has increased so the capital was well sent back to the core of germany and this uh, caused first of all a uh, a shock to nominal income in the peripheral countries and of course because of a stickiness of prices a recession now there is also another explanation this is more connected with the uh, monetary policy of the european central bank but this is not uh, the same kind of analysis that uh, it is uh, often found in Austrian writings. It is more connected with the monetary school of uh, economics. And this theory says that a Eurozone was from start a bad, bad idea. This is of course somehow connected to the optimum currency theory. But the monetarists, mo monetarists stress that uh, a, a decision to raise interest rates um, at, uh, I don't remember which, which year exactly, 2000, uh, nine or ten i don't remember uh caused uh, caused a fall of uh, nominal gdp across the eurozone because it was uh, much uh, much um, mm, more expensive to, to issue debt and this caused a a fall in bank lending and by extension a fall in nominal spending and also uh, some people think that it is because the eurozone sorry the european central bank pursues a rather uh, rather pro-German monetary policy. It focuses on inflation and nominal spending in core of the Eurozone more than on periphery. So this is, this is why the monetary policy wasn't correct. So um, we can show those two opposing uh, views at, at this graph like, like this. The neoclassical view is uh, represented by many economists. I, I will not give you names, but I call this view also the IMF view because the International Monetary Fund seems to have this theory that the crisis in Greece and in other countries was caused by purely uh, fiscal factors. While on the other spectrum you have uh, market monetarists and Keynesians. Uh, so people like Paul Krugman, a Keynesian who, who thinks that Eurozone is not an optimum currency area and it, it, uh, it because, it's because of this that we are having this crisis. And market monetarists such as uh, um, Scott Sandler, Lars Christensen, and, and people like this, who think that the Eurozone uh, and the uh, European uh, Central Bank policy was incorrect, and and this caused a fall in in spending, you know, circular circular flow and stuff like this. And uh, so the question is, where is the Austrian view on this picture? I I think that it is some somewhere more nuanced than than the IMF view but it's rather more to the to the uh, this it's all that scenario rather than rather than the uh, the market monetarist but of course the Austrian school is not uh, homogeneous I would say that we can look at two separate uh, branches of the Austrian school the first one is the uh, what I call a Rothbardian uh, explanation uh, this is uh, more in line with the uh, with the IMF view that it's all about that. Of course, uh, the Rothbardians also stress that uh, it is due to the monetary factors, the construction of the European Central Bank, but it's uh, still rather a um, 
situation, a explanation that emphasizes that rather than nominal spending. And then there is the GMU view. The view oh, I'm not sure if the GMU is the best characterization of this group, but it is a, a view connected more with the monetary equilibrium theory. Uh, so um, it stresses, of course, that, and uh, but also because of its of its uh, monetary equilibrium um, um, uh, theory that they uh, subscribe to is also about nominal spending. So um, if we know what causes that crisis in those two theories, let's think for a moment how to end them. So. Since the um, debt is caused, uh, sorry, since the sovereign debt crisis is caused by too much debt, the neoclassical theory says, well, we should lower the debt level. Now, um, how to do it? There are basically four ways. And uh, <coughs> the first one is the most obvious one to any politician. It is simply to increase uh, the revenue, right? <laughs> To, uh, to, so how to increase the revenue? There are many ways to do it. Of course, uh, the easiest way to do it is to simply raise taxes. But uh, rising taxes is not very good from the from the lo long run perspective, from the perspective of long run growth. So you can also lower taxes if you look at the uh, lapa curve, depending on the tax rate and the place in which economy is. A, a lowering of interest, uh, sorry, lowering of tax rate might cause actually an increase in, in, in um, government revenue. Of course, the LAPACA is a concept which does not have a very strong empirical evidence behind it, but still you can, you can try to decrease tax rates to, to increase revenue. And of course, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't forget about uh, a, a situation in which a, a, a government decides to well, some, sell some of its assets. So in case of Greece, um, they might sell one of their islands, and uh, in case of Poland, for example, we might sell uh, Świętokrzyskie, because, yeah, or the hell, peninsula. So this is basically the increase in revenue view. The second one is to decrease uh, the government spending. And um, this, uh, of course, is a very, very fast solution, because Increases in, in, in revenue take time. You know, I mean, it takes time to increase, to, to change the tax code, and then you have to wait for the money to come in. It's, it's a rather long process, but decreases in spending, well, apart from political reasons, let's say, you, they, they could be, at least in theory, done much quicker. And since um, the majority of people who subscribe to the neoclassical explanation prefer a small size of a state, they usually prefer this. And the third way to decrease that is debt monetization, uh, but since the proponents of the uh, neoclassical view uh, do not think that it was caused by a fall in nominal spending, a monetization of debt would lead to a inflation and historically Almost all cases of hyperinflation were caused by monetization of debt. And then there is Mary Rothbard's favorite uh, debt repudiation. That is a situation in which a country simply says that it will not repay its debts, but this is something that has, um, has not been selling that much. I, I believe mainly because it's uh, not politically possible um, very much. So, what to do according to the aggregate, aggregate demand position? Well, since the main problem is a fall in aggregate demand, in aggregate spending, what we should do is to increase it. Or if, if the, the reason is a fall um, as compared to a trend of nominal GDP, we should go back to the trend so, so everything is in line with expectations of nominal spending. So, how to do it? Well, basically, there are two visions of the, of the um, aggregate demand. The first one is a Keynesian one, and by the way, it's more, uh, more disaggregated than the other one. And uh, so, the nominal GDP in this view is uh, C plus I plus G plus X. So, in order to boost one, uh, uh, to boost nominal spending, we should boost uh, one of these uh, variables, preferably G. 
which is a paradox because a, a way to end a fiscal crisis sometimes it is said, well, we should not cut government spending but increase it. But of course, this is uh, very problematic because a Keynesian theory rests on an assumption that a government bonds are a close substitute to, uh, to money. So if they are not, that's a situation in which there is a uh, market-wide scare uh, for uh, holding government debt might be such a situation. Well, in this case, uh, it is not a very good solution. And there is another view of the, of the aggregate demand. It's uh, even more aggregated. Uh, this is a monetarist view. And it simply says that in order to increase nominal spending, if we look at the equation at the bottom, we should increase M, which is money supply, or V is velocity. But since uh, the governments um, control M more than V, and uh, what they should do is to increase, uh, increase money supply. And of course, there are many different theoretical um, differences between those two positions. Those positions, they, they sometimes go hand in hand, but uh, often, for example, in a situation of a liquidity trap, uh, it is said that uh, while, while you increase a market, sorry, while you increase the money supply, the nominal income would not increase. So, um, we can show a, uh, those two, two versions of a preferred policy sorry, those three versions on a graph. On one, one uh, axis, we have a monetary expansion and monetary tightening. And on the other one, we have fiscal expansion and fiscal tightening. So the easiest one to, to, to put on the graph is a Keynesian policy prescription. Well, it is to, uh, to expand government spending and expand uh, and monetary base. We have uh, an opp opposite view, the Austrian policy prescription. <laughs> I'm not sure if the Monetary tightening is the uh, correct uh, way of phrasing it. To me, uh, it is maybe more keeping a stable monetary policy and uh, doing a fiscal tightening. And a market monetarist perspective is to uh, engage in a monetary expansion, but at the same time engage in a fiscal tightening. And uh, there are many examples of this. Uh, for example, um, England in the uh, 1930s, it went off the gold standard and there was a, a, a very big expansion, monetary expansion, but at the same time they pursued a, a, a rather tight fiscal policy. So overall the aggregate demand increased, but the share of government spending to GDP has decreased. So um, what does the data say? And Lord Keynes once said that when Facts change, I change my mind. So let's look at the data and hopefully some of you might change your opinion about the, about the problem. So rather than showing you a, a large quantities of data, I propose that we play a debt game. Um, this is the data that was normalized. It is a data showing debt levels, government debt levels to GDP. And um, so debt to GDP ratio from 2001 uh, to 2008. So a quick question, which of these graphs, and by the way, these are normalized, so they all start at the same level. They start at 100, which is a, a data in 2001, and then, well, they fluctuate with changes in the, in the in, uh, debt level. So if the graph goes up, it means that uh, the debt has increased, at the relative to GDP, and if it goes down, well, it means that uh, it means that it has decreased. So, which one do you think is Greece? You can earn you can earn a, a one fiduciary banknote from my private bank. Sorry, two thousand one, two thousand eight. Two. Two. Four. Ah. Five. What? Seven. 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 Very good. Yes, it turns out that this this is actually Greece. Okay, so let's pick another one. Um, I don't know. Spain. Let's think about Spain. Five. Six. Uh, <laughs> no. Three. Two. 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 Yes. 
This is Spain. Okay, and uh, the prudent Germans, Deutschland. Where is Deutschland? Nine, three. Three, yes. Three. Okay, and the last one, Italy. Eleven. Eight. Nine, actually nine. Yeah, we can do it uh, all, uh, all day. Okay, so this is the rest of countries. Uh, there is also Poland, although it's not in the Eurozone. And, um, but I, I just showed it to just, 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 so just, so you just look at the, at the trend. Of course, the fact that, that this is a trend does not mean that a debt in, in for example, uh, I don't know, uh, Spain or Italy was low. Uh, if we look at the uh, actual data, this is uh, an average debt to GDP in uh, 2001 to 2008, we will see that, of course, Italy and Greece uh, were, well, they had a large, G sorry, large um, debt to GDP ratio, uh, but Ireland, uh, Spain, well, they did not have the ratio that high. Of course, the absolute values uh, I mean, the, the numerical values uh, are very problematic to interpret, but uh, if we look at the Germany, we had 64.3% uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, we see that, well, if we just want to explain the debt crisis looking at, the, at the, this, these values, well, it's probably not a good way to do it. So let's look at the deficits, because deficits also, also matter. And um, so we have all those deficits. So a minus is a deficit, a plus is Finland, a sur uh, I mean surplus. So uh, the same period, 2001 to 2008. This is a general government, uh, general government uh, deficits. The source is uh, the, uh, I think, Eurostat. I'm not, not sure. So then we look and we see that Greece well, yeah, Greece had a, a big deficit. Portugal, Italy, yeah, also. Where is Poland? Oh, Poland had a rather big deficit. This is an average deficit, so uh, so you have to keep this in mind. But Germany, well, Germany also has a, a um, moderate deficit of uh, minus 2.1% a year. And look at Ireland and Spain. Well, Ireland run surpluses and Spain almost run surpluses. It depends on, on a period. If you take 2000 to 2007, it actually turns out that Spain was running surpluses on average. Okay, so let's move to another variable. This is, uh, well, NGDP, Scott Sumner's favorite variable. And uh, this is basically data for only nine countries because it would be well, too much if I, if I presented more countries. This is the NGDP data from uh, 2001 to, uh, to the present, or actually, sorry, the last observation is uh, first quarter of 2012. This is because I couldn't find uh, other data for other variables that I've incorporated in my econometric model. But the picture, if you extend the data to the future, is very similar. So all nominal expenditures um, increase, but then, well, in some countries, and by the way, this is also normalized, and so they all, they all increase, but in some countries after the crisis, this would be 2008, something somewhere over here, uh, you see that some crisis, uh, so some countries have a falling nominal GDP, and other have a, a growing one. So in order to look at this in a better way, let's look at the nominal GDP, uh, um, and a trend of nominal GDP, this trend was a, a trend from 2000 to 2007, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. So as you can see, uh, in almost all countries, uh, the nominal GDP has fallen. Of course in Poland, since we have a, a, uh, our own currency, the National Bank of Poland was able to evaluate and boost exports, uh, and so the, the nominal GDP did not fall, or, well, uh, maybe it, it stagnated a little bit, but it did not fall uh, very much um, as opposed to a trend. But in a country such as uh, Spain, Italy, Portugal especially, and, and uh, Ireland, uh, not to mention Greece, 
well, the nominal GDP stagnated and it actually has fallen. And uh, as you can see, there is no bounce back. But in the case of Germany, well, there is a bounce back. Austria and France also, you might say that the, the nominal GDP is returning to, the, to a, to a uh, pre-crisis path. So, uh, since I'm an evil person, I do econometrics and I've done a few models. So, I will present uh, a few models that try to incorporate all, all this data and other variables and try to see if uh, they are, uh, they are um, good models, which variables are significant and which are not. So, I've constructed 18 econometric models and you will, you will be, uh, uh, you will have a, uh, a rather, mm, mm, you, you, you will see all these models in a, in, a, in a second. First, let's focus on uh, dependent variables. Well, I've uh, chosen three uh, dependent variables an average spread between the German bonds and a bond of a, a country in question, uh, then a, a CDS spread, an average CDS spread from 2009, and then number of rating downgrades from 2009. So I have assumed that a crisis happened in a, a uh, last period of uh, 2008, uh, I mean a financial crisis, and uh, yeah, let's look what happened from this period on. To the present. So these are the dependent variables. Uh, the, the number of rating downgrades were taken from Fitch rating agency, mainly because it is the only agency that uh, publishes its data for free. And uh, but if I had a, a other other rating agency's data, I would probably uh, use them as well. So what are the independent variables? Ah, hmm. not good. I forgot to talk about independent variables. Uh, okay, so the independent variables, let me go through, through uh, what I remember. Well, first of all, it was an average uh, debt to GDP from 2001 to 2008. Then it was an average deficit, so debt, deficit. And uh, then there was a um, um, uh, an index of uh, Heritage Foundation, the the Freedom Index, or I don't remember how it's called. So this Freedom Index and, um, and uh, a variable saying, specifying if a country is a, is a member of, of the Eurozone, this is a zero one variable, another variable specifying if a country is a post-socialist country and uh, a variable that uh, probably uh, needs some clarification, which is, well, um, NGDP gap. So NGDP gap uh, basically is this, uh, and if NGDP gap is uh, negative, this means that the situation is bad. That is, that nominal spending falls uh, uh, compared to, to the trend. So um, let's go, oh, here are the independent variables. Uh, sorry for that. So these are all those variables. So. Uh, yeah, NGDP gap, average government debt to GDP ratio, average government uh, deficit, an average economic uh, freedom index, Eurozone participation, and uh, is it a post-socialist country? I wanted to incorporate more data, but unfortunately, there are there are there is data that is missing for all those countries. So it's uh, you know it would it would result in a uh, uh, in lowering the number of countries in a sample, and it, it's not good for a estimation. So let's go to a the spread model. This is a spread between a, a country's uh, um, bonds and the German German bonds. So uh, I've uh, done uh, six models because uh, I, the data. Well, there is not much data. We only have, I don't know, 20 countries in Europe or so. So uh, I have to uh, keep the, the number of degrees of freedom uh, so the, the estimation is robust. So as you can see, we have six different models and estimations uh, marked with asterisks are uh, these that are stat statistically significant. So a three, uh, a three stars means that uh, it is uh, significant at uh, 0.01 level, 
two stars uh, it is significant at 0.02 level and uh, one star is significant at 0.1 level. The data was checked for multicollinearity and controlled and so what you see is just uh, in those, these estimates. So as you can see all the parameters these are different models, right? Different, six different models, and these are parameters. So all parameters standing next to the NGDB gap variable are statistically significant and they are negative. So it means when a NGDB gap is negative, so everything is bad below the trend, well, this times a negative parameter means that they spread will go up. So if a nominal GDP falls, the spread increases. Okay. Now, the parameter standing next to the dead variable is significant only in, in one instance, in this model, and it is positive and significant uh, in the model in which you have NGDP, dead, and uh, Eurozone and uh, post-socialist uh, data. You see the R squared uh, statistics, uh, they are not very high, which means that there are probably some variables that were omitted, and it's also because of a nature of the model that's, that these, uh, these uh, statistic is, is run low. Okay, so uh, let's go to different sets of, set of models. This is a Fitch rating model. Now, a Fitch rating model also has the same variables. And this is the counter data model that, that, that means that it, uh, a dependent variable is a variable that uh, has... Uh, mm, which, which is a count variable, that is, it can, uh, can be equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on. So, the Fitch data model, the uh, Fitch rating model, sorry, um, gives similar, similar estimates as the previous one. So, all parameters standing to the nominal GDP are negative, and only um, three that stand next to the dead parameter are are statistically significant, uh, but um, yeah, and this is the case. Uh, constant is also significant in some cases, and uh, yeah, the post-socialist uh, is uh, post-socialist variables also significant into into instances. Now, the McFadden R squared is a a um, different version of the same um, of the same uh, statistic the R squared for a count data model and it is well it is also around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 which suggests that there were some variables that were omitted but this is uh, mainly to the to the um, characteristics of the cross-sectional models. Now let's look at the CBS uh, model. This is a credit credit default swap model. And if CBS well first of all let me say what a CBS is. A, a credit default swap is uh, rising in value and uh, when, when the risk of the default is increasing. So basically it rises when things are bad. So if we look at the estimates, well, we see that the uh, once again the estimates next to the NGDP data are all significant, they are also all negative, while the only, uh, only in one situation a, um, a parameter standing next to the dead variable is significant. The rest is insignificant and the R squared is uh, lower than before. So, uh, let's go to conclusions. Well, um, I strongly believe that the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis is not as simple as some people think, especially people who tend to, um, tend to focus on, on debt and not on nominal GDP. I do believe that falling nominal GDP on nominal income played a significant role in causing or deepening, depending on your on your view uh, of, of the crisis. And uh, what's more, the programs aiming to end uh, the fiscal crisis should focus on boosting nominal expenditure. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, probably it should be better if it would be a private expenditure. But if the expenditure falls and the Prices will be even, even even more severe. And finally, of course, uh, the models I presented have uh, their limitations. They are cross-sectional uh, models. Uh, a preferable way to look at this problem would be to construct a different panel data models. 
so we can look at different uh, countries uh, separately and maybe the situation was like this that that Greece had a, a debt crisis while other countries had a nominal income crisis. So thank you for your attention and if you have any questions I would be more than happy to answer them. You, you are including Ireland in the sovereign debt crisis as a neoclassical would say that it was a debt crisis, right? That's your message? Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, because it's the situation in Ireland is, is, of course, complicated. It, it is, it is uh, well, we should focus on uh, the uh, nominal income, not only because it has uh, an um, effect on government debt, but also on a banking sector, because there's also a lot of debt, and there was a lot of debt there, especially connected with the real estate boom. So, yeah, in, in a way, this is what accelerated a fall of, uh, of nominal GDPs. Of nominal GDP. So, I don't claim that Ireland is an example of debt crisis. I just, uh, I just uh, think that uh, it was a debt crisis after the nominal GDP fell. Yeah, sure, but uh, I mean, is it a bit of a strong to include Ireland in your models to bash no classicals? Uh, since I don't have any no, no, to, to include Ireland in the model is a good thing to do because you you, you, you describe all the countries. I do not claim that uh, the uh, the island is such a case. When I when I was presenting the uh, the uh, the slide on the neoclassical and I said oh peaks countries, uh, if I remember correctly, I said that oh Ireland maybe it's not not such a case. So, so it was just a typo. But no, Ireland is not a case of a debt crisis, and I do not believe. That a crisis on Ireland was caused by, by yeah, that. Either, but the question is, does anybody actually believe that? In no, the no, 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 no. Okay. Where, where does your conclusion that the most nominal, nominal income come from? I, I, didn't, I didn't follow how you were at well, if you subscribe to the aggregate demand view of, of the debt crisis, sovereign debt crisis, and if you believe that a um, ability ability to repay your debt uh, depends on your income, and if you believe that a debt is sticky, that is uh, a it does not fall with a falling nominal GDP, then when the GDP falls and uh, uh, tax revenue falls, the government will have problems with uh, you know generating enough tax revenue to repay the debt. And the debt to GDP ratio would increase, so investors would, well, they would uh, try to sell the bonds, which would also increase the interest rate. And if you subscribe to this view, and if you, if you look at the estimates, and if you believe uh, in, in, in the models, well, uh, it also shows that uh, a nominal income was, uh, was caused, uh, sorry, a, a fall in nominal income was one of the major, major causes of the, of the crisis. Of course, the question then is what caused this nominal income to fall, but this is, this is another, another thing. And how, how, do, how do you boost it? If you don't explain... Yeah, yeah, basically there are two views, the Keynesian view and the monetarist view. The Keynesian view is to, well, increase spending no matter what. That is, preferably through a fiscal expansion, or I should rather say, for, through uh, not contract, contracting fiscal expenditure relative to trend. And also by boosting uh, nominal spending by by a monetary policy. But by fiscal expenditure, you don't you don't uh, repay the debt, or, or you actually increase also the denominator. Yes, yes. This is this is a, a, a thing which is a a shortcoming of a Keynesian theory because they assume uh, that a government debt is a close substitute to money. That is, uh, if you print more uh, bonds, it will have a stimulative effect on nominal spending. I do not subscribe to this theory, also because I do not, su do not subscribe to the, um, uh, the theory of um, liquidity trap. I do believe that monetary policy is more useful in, in, that, in that regard. Okay, do you think that in the Baltic countries, uh, where I would say what you described as the Austrian way was uh, that monetary tightening, the money supply actually fell in these countries as well as fiscal tightening. Uh, do you think it worked? 
Well, of course, when I when I seen the data that um, I don't know who presented this data. But yeah, it was during this conference. I I uh, see the value of this explanation that is a fiscal tightening and a good monetary policy. When it goes hand in hand, it uh, it will lead to to the uh, uh, end of the crisis, but. Um, uh, I'm not really sure. I, I do believe that uh, in case of countries such as uh, Greece, Spain and, uh, and Italy, uh, the crisis in which uh, nominal wages has increased very, very much and uh, they are rather sticky, well, uh, it would take a long period of time for them to return to a trend. And since uh, Greece and, other, and these other countries have a very high debt-to-GDP ratio, a cost of... Um, Renegotiation, renegotiation of uh, of all those debt contracts would be much higher than, for example, uh, the Baltic countries. And what data would you have to see to say that? Let's say the Austrian explanation is uh, the the right one. What, what do you mean on this? Well, of course, I would I would prefer because I also uh, well the difference between. <laughs> the aggregate demand and the, uh, let's say, neoclassical explanation, well, it's a theoretical difference, but it might be the case that, that a uh, aggregate demand theory fits uh, facts better for uh, Mediterranean countries, while the uh, other theories and other solutions fit better for, for the Baltic countries. So I would have to, to look at the, the panel data, that is, both uh, the... Uh, you know, cross-sectional and time series data. And I would probably look at the, you know, exposition of the banking sectors to different uh, assets, and this would be something that I would do. I'm not sure if this answers your question or not. Another question about islands. Uh, since you want to stabilize NGDP by monetary policy, but maybe I did not have did not have the fiscal expansion before, but it sure had uh, credit expansion. So when people are already you know, flooded with debts and the households and investors, mm -hmm. is monetary policy not you know, causing another trouble, another credit? Yeah, expansion? it depends. How do you look at the monetary policy? If you look at the monetary policy as uh, it is usually done, that is, if you look at it through a interest rate channel, then of course, if you are indebted uh, very much and you decrease interest rates, well, people would probably not take more debt. But monetary policy does not work through the interest rate channel only. It works from many different transmission mechanisms. To me, as a market monetarist, uh, it works mainly through the expectations channel. So a change in a monetary policy would boost expectations of, of future nominal spending. This is the, the, the thing we discussed before. For example, a change um, in an inflation target to a higher one is, a, is an example of a, a uh, accommodative ex expansionary monetary policy. It does not do anything with interest rates, but then still, when people see that inflation will increase, they increase their spending because they want to buy goods at lower prices. So it, it's, of course, connected with interest rates and that that problem is a huge problem, but I'm not sure it's something that uh, permits monetary policy to be effective. Okay, I'm afraid we don't have time for more questions. The next lecture starts in five minutes, so please uh, be very quick.